Hey you guys, here I am once again for my Flickers of Fear movie review show. Now this movie, holy crap, I can't believe it took me this long to see this goddamn movie. So what ended up happening with this one? For whatever reason, about five or six years ago, I mean, you guys know I'm really into Italian giallo movies and Italian horror in general. But a few years back, probably five or six years, I kind of went off on this big long tear where I was pretty much watching nothing but that and that I was doing a bunch of, uh, you know, reviews of them or writing about them a lot for my blog. And one evening in particular, I just kind of got this wild hair and I was sort of like, I wonder if anybody nowadays, because I hadn't really kept up with a lot of newer horror, you know, right around the time this came out. I was like, I wonder if anybody doing anything new in that style, because that would be really cool and I would like to see that. So I looked it up and it turned out that there had been, not a lot, but, you know, some more modern examples of giallo or giallo adjacent type of movies. And one of these was called Barbarian Sound Studio. Now this came out in 2012. So I kind of made a list and I wrote it down and I said, oh, I'll need to see that one of these days. And then I guess I kind of, you know, as time went on, I sort of forgot about it. And then for whatever reason, the other day, I was sort of thinking about uh, Giallo movies, or I was thinking about something like that. And I was like, man, I should I should see that because, you know, I've been wanting to see it for such a long time. And it sounded really cool, like the premise of it. And it's not exactly a Giallo movie, but it's kind of based in that world. You know what I mean? Which uh, I'll get to in a minute. So finally, I went over to Amazon Prime and rented it. I believe it was 2 or $3.99. Maybe you can get it somewhere else on another streaming service. I'm not really sure, but that's where I got it. And I finally sat down and watched it. And holy crap, where has this movie been all my life? I feel like this movie was made pretty much with my exact demographic in mind. It's the craziest shit ever. So like I said, this came out back in 2012. Now, this is, I believe, the second film of uh, the British director and screenwriter, Peter Strickland. I think his first movie was a uh, Hungarian film. I think it was even Hungarian language. I haven't seen it, but it got a lot of notice, uh, I guess, when it came out. But this was his second one. And this is, man, this is such a fascinating premise. Now, I'm going to say, like, this is a psychological horror film, and it's very concerned with sound and the effect of sound. I mean, hence being called Barbarian Sound Studio. It doesn't show a lot uh, in the sense of gore. A lot of it is, like, suggestion. And some reviews, like, most of the reviews I've seen have been, like, really, really positive, uh, with particular, like, you know, very famous uh, British film reviewer, Mark Carmode, he thought it was, uh, the, I think, the best British film of 2012, if not the best film of 2012 altogether. But I feel like um, one kind of divisive thing is some people didn't really like the way it ended. And I will say that if you're not real into surrealism, or if you're going to be one of those people that's just like, oh my god, what the fuck is going on? It's just kind of gone off the rails or it's being surreal for the sake of it, then probably you won't like this uh, because it does take a turn uh, toward the third act. But you know me, I love that shit. So I was, I was totally on board, even though I'm not sure... I'm not sure I entirely get it in the sense that, I mean, I don't know. The the way that it ends can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, I guess. But, you know, we'll get into that. So this story is set sometime in the 60s or 70s. It's not entirely clear and it doesn't really matter. Whenever, like, the heyday of the Italian Giallo movie was. So we have this kind of mousy, milk toast English sound engineer known only as Gilderoy. And he's played by Toby Jones, who is a character actor who has been in fucking everything, man. Like, I knew I had seen him in a ton of shit, and I couldn't remember exactly what. Uh, he played Truman Capote in uh, Infamous. I think that was kind of his first breakout role. He was the voice of Dobby in the Harry Potter movies. Um, he played a character in some of the Marvel movies. He was in The Hunger Games. He was in W. He was in The Mist. He's been in, he was in Jurassic World. He's just been in a fucking, fucking ton of stuff. He was in Frost Nixon. So yeah, if you've seen the dude, you'll recognize him because he's been in a lot of really big movies. I mean, this, this is really his movie because this is a great fucking performance. So Gilderoy is this very, you know, very uptight, very kind of mama's boy uh, sort of sound engineer. And he is hired uh, to go to Italy and work on a film. Now... His uh, forte, I guess, uh, is sort of like English 
nature documentaries, very twee, uh, and he's doing the sound engineering. So he's very into listening to the sounds of nature, like recording wind and birds and things like that. So he gets summoned to Italy, I guess because his reputation precedes him or whatever, um, to work on a film that he thinks is a nature film, I guess, about horses. And it's called, because it's called uh, The Equestrian Vortex. Now, when he gets there, he finds out that this movie is actually a really, really over-the-top, graphically violent uh, Jello film. And this really does not sit very well with him at all. Now, one of the really interesting things about this movie is that it's a movie about making a movie, but you never actually get to see the movie that they're making. You can hear it because, like I said, that's kind of like the whole, that's kind of this whole movie's thing is the sound design and how sound and horror kind of go to, and like it really, the sound that they do like really kind of, uh, you know, makes your imagination run wild or whatever. So I will note too that I love love. I knew I was going to love this movie like in the first couple seconds because instead of having traditional opening credits like this movie is called Barbarian Sound Studio and stars this that and the other, it actually had opening credits for the giallo film that is inside the film, The Equestrian Vortex, and they are spot on. I mean, so it was just kind of like this 60s, 70s psychedelic satanic kind of shit with all this red stuff with all the all the credits are in Italian and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, movie. Uh oh, y you know what I like. So, yeah. So I love that they fucking did that. And then they just go into the movie. So over the course of the film, he starts working on this movie. He gets there. And after he gets to, I mean, pretty much the whole entire movie takes place inside this studio. You never see the outside. I don't think you ever see the outside other than one kind of weird like interstitial where they show part of a documentary that he worked on, which was like the English countryside and stuff. But other than that, the whole entire thing is set inside the studio. It's all inside. So you never know whether it's daytime or nighttime. So it's this really creepy, like insular, claustrophobic kind of vibe going on. And it really does well, like setting up this whole sense of dread because, you know, here's this very mousy, shy Englishman who gets to this job and that he thinks is going to be one thing, but then it turns out to be like this shockingly violent movie that he's really not comfortable with doing the sound effects for. And also there's, so there's a big culture clash. Um, he doesn't speak Italian. Some of the other people speak English, but some of them don't. And everyone seems vaguely not, not hostile necessarily, but they're just kind of, you know, he he doesn't really relate to them in the same way that he would relate to somebody from his own country, perhaps. Uh, they just seem very kind of brusque and, uh, you know, and kind of rude, even though from their point of view, they're not being rude and they're always kind of like over the top and boisterous and he just can't, you know, get with it. And also you're kind of like, even from the beginning, you're not entirely sure. I mean, you know that probably something sinister is going on, but you're not entirely sure what it is, which I think is like really good because it just has this really creepy, like what the fuck is happening with this shit. So most of the movie is him kind of getting increasingly disturbed by this movie that they're making. Because, and like I said, they never show the actual movie, The Equestrian Vortex, other than the opening credits, like at the very beginning. But, you know, the, the film is always kind of going and then you see the people reacting to it and then you see all the people that are coming in doing the sound effects on it. So they have like all these women coming in, doing the overdubbing, um, you know, all these women coming in screaming, them doing like the music, them doing Foley. So like they'll bring in all these vegetables and stuff and like chop them up or throw them on the floor, like for people getting chopped up and stabbed and falling out, falling onto the concrete and, you know, that kind of stuff, which is great. So you can kind of imagine what's going on in the movie, uh, even though you can't see it because you can see like his increasingly horrified reactions to it. So that kind of goes on. But then, uh, and this is going to be a, a bit spoilery, I think. Although, like I said, I don't know. This is one of those movies where I don't think it really matters if it's spoiled or not, because... The whole thing is just so concerned with the atmosphere that it builds and like just the weirdness surrounding it that it's not like, you know, it's not like a straightforward narrative story. So it's not like, oh, big plot twist and you spoiled it, blah, blah. But so right about two thirds of the way through the movie, 
you start to think that maybe everything is not as it seems. Because up to this point, everything seems pretty straightforward. You know, you're kind of uncomfortable with this character because he's like, everyone seems kind of cranky towards him or seems like they have their own agendas and you're not really sure what they are. And he's just doesn't want to work on this movie anymore because he finds it uh, revolting and disgusting and violent. You know, the, the director of the movie, whose name is Santini, who shows up later, he keeps trying to deny that it's a horror film. It's like, no, I'm just showing what's true, man. It's a, the movie is essentially like, it's like Suspiria, like in the sense that it's about witches, but it's also about like people torturing witches. So, you know, it's kind of that type of thing. And so a lot of the things that you hear are, you know, people being tortured or sound effects of being tortured. But then uh, there's kind of a recurring thing through, throughout the, uh, the movie where Gilderoy keeps wanting to be uh, reimbursed for his flight to Italy because they said they would reimburse him because obviously he's coming there for a job. And every time he tries to get the money, you know, people keep pawning him off. It's like, oh, that's not my department. Or why don't you go ask so-and-so? Like, they act like, act like they don't really care. And then, like, the director's like, what, you don't trust us? You think we're not going to pay you? And he gets, like, kind of hostile about it. And then finally, like, this other woman that's been working on the movie like as one of the uh, overdubbing actresses and the one that's been screaming and stuff in the booth, she says to him, she's like, you know, these type of people, you just have to go in and like demand what you want. They don't, you can't just ask them. You can't just say, oh, hey, can you check on that? You have to go in there and go, give me this right now. And you have to do that kind of stuff. So he goes and he starts like kind of throwing his weight around. So he does that and people seem to respond well to it. But then it turns out that they said, well, we can't, they call around and they try to check and they're like, well, we can't reimburse you for your, uh, for your ticket for the flight because that flight doesn't exist. And at this point, things go real Inland Empire uh, in the sense that, I mean, not quite that <laughs> out there, uh, which is a David Lynch movie, if you haven't seen it, not quite that out there, but reality and the movie that they're making start to blend together. After that revelation that this flight did, like, apparently never occurred, uh, so they can't pay him for it, then shit starts to get weird. Like, he starts to have dreams where he walks out of his room or the apartment that he's staying in, and then he's back in the studio. Then he sees movies of himself up on the thing, like, doing shit that he just did. Then the movie goes in a direction where it kind of starts over again from earlier scenes, but now he's dubbed into Italian as though he's in the movie. So it's almost kind of like you're not really sure where the reality of this movie and the movie are. And then you're kind of thinking, like he gets these, has these couple of letters from his mom uh, you know, because he lived with his mom back in England. He's from Dorking. I love that, which is a real place in case you didn't know. Because <laughs> I remember seeing the signs for that over there. I'm like, oh man, that's unfortunate. But yeah, so uh, so he's from Dorking. And uh, so he had some letters from his mom and his mom was talking about, oh, these birds that had nested there. And then like the the letters get increasingly horrific. Like, oh, some, some magpies came and killed all the birds and tore their heads off and there's blood everywhere and all this other stuff. But then like later they have to bring in like, like one of the actresses gets pissed off at the director and destroys like all of the shit that she recorded. So they have to bring in somebody else to re-record her stuff. And that person starts reciting stuff from Gilderoy's mom's letters. So it just goes real, real weird. So you're not really sure if he's a real person or I don't know. So, so it's just kind of like, so keep in mind that it's that kind of thing. So it gets like real surreal toward the end where reality and the movie that they're making are overlapping and you're not entirely sure if he's a real person or if he's just a character in this movie. So it's like a movie within a movie, like a Mobius strip type of uh, deal. Like I said, it kind of reminded me of uh, Inland Empire in that way. Also going to say gave me some Videodrome vibes a little bit. Uh, a little bit like Peeping Tom, uh, that type of shit. Maybe it looks like maybe some Polanski movies. Um, some people have compared it to The Conversation with uh, Gene Hackman. So, or maybe like a Blow Up, kind of like that too. So if that sounds like something, that, like I said, this is not, it's based on, you know, the back story of it is like Giallo and there's little nods in there to like, you know, the dude that runs one of the, 
uh, machine says like wearing a black glove and there's so there's like little easter eggs in there for people that are into giallo movies and like i said that opening credit scene is just i knew i was gonna love the movie as soon as i saw that because i was like oh my god that's fantastic but this in itself is not a giallo movie it's more like a surrealist psychological horror that's based in that world but that said i mean it's just, it's so weird and it's just so, so good. And it's like, I can't believe that I took this long to fucking see it. It's just amazing. And I will note too, that because sound is pretty much, I mean, very, very much to the forefront in this movie, it's kind of like the the main character really is all the screams and the sound effects and just all the sound design. The sound design is fantastic. So I would actually recommend that you, if you watch it, like kind of watch it in a quiet environment and on a really good sound system so you can kind of appreciate like all the all the score and all the stuff that's going on because it's really it's it's really amazing you know again not a traditional horror movie but if you like giallo films if you like surrealist type of films anything like david lynch or you know like i said kind of cronenberg and anything kind of like that it's not bloody there's not like you know it's not big murders or anything like that you don't really see anything gory but it's just a real weird creepy you know, just kind of dread inducing psychological horror with a really interesting, with, you know, with, with a giallo tinge and with, you know, set in an interesting setting that you don't see a lot in horror movies. So yeah, um, definitely check it out. Like I said, I rented it on Amazon Prime. I think it was $2.99 or $3.99 or something like that. If you're in another country, I don't know, it might be on another streaming service because it's a British film. Uh, so I checked UK Shutter and I didn't see it on there. So I don't know where you guys can get it, but I'm sure you can get it somewhere else uh, easily if it sounds like your kind of thing. But yeah, I, I really dug it. And uh, if you like that kind of stuff, then I probably, then I think you probably will too. But let me know in the comments if you saw it and what you thought of it. And uh, that will do it for this Flickers of Fear. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.